Welcome to the Hudson Institute. Uh, I'm Adjunct Fellow Josh Block, and it's my privilege today to welcome you to this conversation about uh, the Abraham Accords on their one-year anniversary. And we're joined by two fantastic representatives to discuss it with us. Ophir Akunis is a member of the Knesset in Israel. He's been a, a minister in the government for education, for science and technology, for a number of things. I would be remiss if I did them all and I forgot <laughs> one. And, and Ruth Wasserman Landy is a, uh, is a, a member of Knesset of Blue and White, who's a part of the ruling coalition, uh, whereas uh, Ophir has now found himself in, in, in opposition, which That's is right. a, new, a new change for the Likud party in Israel. So yeah. elections have consequences. They say, <laughs> but you know, as in Washington, when when where fractious discussion of ideas in politics has become the norm, we often say that there is really one issue that that unites folks across both sides of the aisle, and that is American support for Israel. Mm -hmm. And as I as I sit here with the two of you, who who are you know not just from different parties, but from you know opposition and 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 you know in leadership these days. It strikes me too that you know perhaps in Israel these days the Abraham Accords are a positive idea that unite everyone across all sectors of politics, society. Is that is that how, how were these accords embraced in in public in politics? How did it happen when it when it was announced? You want to start, please. First of all, thank you very mm -hmm. much for having us here. I'd say that the Abraham Accords are over and above political strife in Israel, in general, they are uh, not only accepted, but they are embraced um, by almost all political parties, with one exception, and that is the joint Arab list mm. of um, Arab-Israeli leaders elected to the parliament that believe that um, these agreements, let's say, for pass or um, leave out the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. Other than that, parties on the left and the right, as you can see, we have the Likud party and my party, Blue and White, um, and a myriad of other people within the caucus itself, representing all of the other parties, agreeing <coughs> that the Abraham Accords are conducive, useful, uh, game-changing, and something that is definitely to the benefit of the state of Israel and the region. Sure. It's a consensus uh, between left and right, coalition and opposition. Uh, as you mentioned, I served then as, not as a minister of education yet. Uh, yeah, minister of, yeah. Minister, uh, maybe one day, yeah. the minister of <laughs> regional cooperation. Mm -hmm. And uh, we brought it to the parliament, we brought it to the Knesset and accept the Arab list, as uh, Ruth mentioned, and Dram as well, but then I think they were part of the Arab list. Uh, um, all, all of the parties from right and left uh, voted for, in favor. So I think it was, uh, first of all, as you said, it's not a, you know, ordinary thing that in the Knesset uh, we are voting together, but I think that the the fact that it was, I suppose that we will talk about it, peace for peace, and the real peace, mm -hmm. and economic peace, uh, it's, you know, brought all of us together, uh, and the fact that we are co-chairs in the new caucus of Abraham Accords is another example yeah. to the consensus. How, do you, how would you describe sort of the, the everyday reaction among Israelis? You know, the, the notion of being accepted in the region is certainly something that you know, people, we sing. I mean, as I, I went to kindergarten there, although I'm not Israeli, but, you know, we sing about, people sing about, you know, it's talked about, it's in the, you know, everything in, in, in Jewish prayer at, at, mm -hmm. at temple is about peace. Mm -hmm. You know, how do you think it felt for average Israelis to see this unfold as it did? I'd just like to say that as somebody who served... Um, in Cairo as an Israeli diplomat, uh, after 40 odd years of peace, a uh, very important strategic key um, relationship with very little normalization or warmth. The fact that um, there is an acceptance of Israel in the region is something that is very, very heartwarming. Israelis warm to that. So for the first time, it is almost we are the legitimate wife rather than the, mm. you know, 
Well, the numbers of tourism, you know, the numbers of Israelis traveling to the Emirates and other countries just in the last year or so, so how many, and, and during a corona-depressed travel period, I was struck by, well, how did... How, well, First of all, for your question, yeah. uh, Israel wants peace. From 1948, we called it Megillat Atzmaut, uh, for peace with our neighbors. And by the way, it was also then right and left. David Ben-Gurion and Menachem Begin, both of them called for peace to the Arabs. And you mentioned the kindergarten. I was in the kindergarten when Sadat came to Jerusalem, to the Knesset. I was four years old, four and a half, something like that. And I remember the pictures. It was only uh, one channel in the Israeli television then, in 1977. And I, I remember the, the pictures from Ben Gurion, and then, then, then from the Knesset, from the same place, from the same podium. Mm -hmm. Uh, and and uh, of course it was uh, you know uh, like a holiday, a new holiday for the Israelis. And we called for peace, and then we were very happy for the peace with Jordan. I think that uh, the fact that uh, we approved and actually uh, we voted for two till now peace treaties with Bahrain and uh, the Emirates uh, reflects the uh, fact that Israel wants peace, the parliament, and actually the parliament reflects the Israeli society, sure. but the, the citizens themselves, and you mentioned the numbers of uh, tourists, and um, we are looking forward to another countries, uh, and to our, even to our closest neighbors, but this is a different, uh, different issue, and we will talk about it in a few minutes. You know, I we'll talk you, about the Palestinians, well, well, of listening course. To your, listening to your story about kindergarten and that time period reminds me just that, you know, this is an opportunity for us, for me to discuss these issues with, and for others who join us to hear the views of two emerging leaders in Israel. Mm -hmm. You know, you guys are the generation that's coming, you know, Generation X, as they called it back in the day, right? You know, and now emerging into, into real power as the older generation begins to step somewhat from from the stage and so it is it's interesting to watch these changes take place you know as you guys are evolving in these positions having watched the previous generations work so hard mm -hmm. to get there you know israel really did just extend its hand in peace all it really wanted was was peace and to hear you know i i i'm i feel the same kind of warmth inside when i see the and and the the, the true nature of the desire on am on part of both parties but particularly in the arab world to embrace Israel and, and be part of this conversation. It's really remarkable. Mm -hmm. Very remarkable. I think that the onus was particularly on Egypt in 1978 when, you know, we signed the um, Camp David Accords, the, the peace treaty brokered by the U.S. Um, it was a pioneer, sort of paving the way. Um, I believe that it needs to get the necessary credit for what it did. Um, but the Egyptian peace um, is very far away from the warm people-to-people -people kind of platform that um, we're speaking about when we look at the Abraham Accords mm -hmm. in terms of science and technology, in terms of culture, in terms of um, policies, medical policies, given the pandemic right now. Um, frankly, the sky's the limit. But more so than anything else, I think that um, this is a true opportunity to gather ourselves and our thinking around challenges that are regional, mm -hmm. that have for far too long not found a solution. Here we are, a kind of a coalition of like-minded countries, not similar, but like-minded, um, really able to look for solutions that are out of the box, that have not been thought of, um, for the betterment of all of our people. Mm -hmm. And this is something that is true of Egypt and Jordan, true of the Abraham Accords, and something that the average Israeli, as you had mentioned, is taught from childhood to embrace, um, if possible. If possible, it's a good question. If possible, and this is the difference between um, uh, the peace treaties with Jordan, mm. uh, it's, a, it's a state. With uh, Egypt, it's very ancient, uh, ancient people, actually. 
and um, the Emirates, Bahrain, Morocco, even Sudan. And unfortunately, not with the Palestinians, because uh, I think that, by the way, September is a very unique uh, month. Uh, uh, we signed the Abraham Accords uh, here in Washington. Uh, we signed the Camp David Accords then, and then in March 79, the peace treaty with Egypt and um, the Oslo agreements. And this is the opposite. The Oslo agreements are absolutely the opposite. And I have to tell you that everybody in Israel wants peace. Nobody wants war. Nobody wants to fight with our neighbors, not only with Lebanon, not with Syria, and, and not with the Palestinians. The question is they want to destroy us. This is the main question, because I don't want a war. I don't want to fight, with, not with the Lebanese, not with the Syrians, not with the Palestinians. But uh, let's talk about the Palestinians. Uh, you can drive from Jerusalem to Ramallah in 15 minutes. You don't need an aircraft. You don't need to fly, you know, like to the Emirates or to Bahrain or even to Morocco. And direct flights, by the way, not through Spain anymore. But they don't want peace. This is a fact. Now, you can say it, and it sounds not so, you know, politically correct, uh, but this is the truth. Why? Because twice in the last 20, except Oslo. Okay, Oslo, it's in the beginning of the 90s. I'm talking about uh, uh, the last 20 years. The second Camp David, I think, by Ehud Barak, and the talks between Ehud Olmert and Abu Mazen. Uh, we offer them almost everything, almost everything, including the ancient city in Jerusalem. And uh, they, they said, no, we, we want more. Not only the east side of Jerusalem, we want parts of the west side of Jerusalem. And, and Assad is not a Palestinian, but when we offered him all the Golan Heights, he said, I want to put my legs in the Kinneret, uh, in the lake of the Galilee. So, and, and this is the difference, I think, between, as Wood mentioned, uh, the, the um, Abraham Accords, the peace with Jordan and peace with Egypt. Well, you know, there's been so many different attempts and formulas to get to the same thing. Mm -hmm. You know, land for peace. Mm -hmm. Israel gives the land and they return the peace. That one didn't quite work. <laughs> mm -hmm. So then we, when I, I think the policy was sort of, well, peace for land. You know, we're over here and, you know, Israel's behind the thing. And if you want to behave civilly, then mm -hmm. terrific. Mm -hmm. Uh, and now, you know, uh, you're sort of describing it, you know, the, the, another evolution of that formula. And I think the, the region itself, it seems to me, just got tired of being held captive to someone else's uh, narrow uh, agenda and, and sort of, uh, you know, without, without sure, you know, corruption and lack of ability to, to, to straighten things out and be leaders. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, I, you know, it's, it's, it's sad to see pal the Palestinian people being the you know, the, the, being on the short end of that stick. But hasn't that been the story since the beginning? I mean, you know, I remember if you go back to Palestinian poetry and literature in the, in the early 50s, they aren't bemoaning Israel. Mm -hmm. They're bemoaning the Arab states who've left them in squalor and, and used yeah. them as a cudgel in their own wars. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a, it is a story of tragedy, but at the same time, you know, modern times sort of demanded that people move past that stuff. And so well, I certainly hope that there is mm -hmm. opportunity in the, and that the Palestinians want uh, to participate in the prosperity that's there. And I look at Egypt and I say, maybe Egypt sees, and the people of Egypt see, the participation and the warmth that goes on between Israel and, the, and these other nations. And they say, hey, look, you know, there's a much bigger dividend mm -hmm. for us in this peace agreement if we, mm -hmm. if we embrace it. Do you see that as a possibility? I think it's very important for us to do everything within our vested power to really uh, make evident the fruits of peace, exactly for that reason. We need to show the people on the street in Egypt, we need to show the Palestinians, we need to show um, people who have a rational kind of Western one plus one kind of logic that there are fruits for peace, so job opportunity and creation and diversification, economy, and so on, and a complete lack of terrorism uh, and security considerations um, would be conducive to that kind of uh, fruition mm -hmm. 
um, of what mm. is the potential of peace. What do, you, yeah, what do you think Israel has to offer in that regard? I mean, the ed higher education is, you know, is such an opportunity for folks. What are the... So it depends. Again, with Egypt, there is, I would say, very little to almost no people-to-people. -people. It's very sad. Um, the strategic security intelligence-oriented cooperation is extremely, extremely high. Um, people in Egypt and in Cairo simply do not know Israelis. Mm -hmm. So I, for example, when I served in Egypt, walking as a normal human being, hopefully, in the streets of Cairo, meeting an Egyptian, that would um, bring about very odd responses because they were simply not used to seeing Israelis. That was how odd it was for the people, we're talking about 100 million yeah. people, to actually meet the other side, which is certainly not conducive to any kind of warm, uh, research-oriented, culture-oriented, and so on kind of peace. Um, so what can they see? What fruits can they actually see? I think we should be more creative mm -hmm. about what Egypt, just as an example, mm -hmm. or what Jordan can show their own people. And that needs a decision mm -hmm. by the top leadership in Egypt and in Jordan to um, make those fruits visible to the actual people, yeah. likewise with the Palestinians. And the question is the will. Well, it also, I also wonder whether there's an opportunity in that for those of us to you know, begin to look for what the needs are among the strategic partners in the region. And this is something we're working on here at Hudson is to then begin to identify those needs and, and identify mm -hmm. folks who can provide those solutions, match them up so that they can build the kind of local joint venture, the local presence. And exactly. you know, obviously you know, there's an opportunity there for finance to come in and make how everyone can, can succeed there. So to me, it feels like there we, we, we're facing great opportunity. And particularly, I, I had a conversation the other day with uh, a friend in, uh, in leadership in, in, uh, in Dubai. Mm -hmm. And we were talking about um, economics and trade and mm -hmm. their desire you know, to mm -hmm. evolve past an oil and a petroleum economy mm -hmm. yeah. and the need to do that. You know, every country's got 2030 and 2070. Mm -hmm. and, and we were, we were also talking about the context of, of some of these important uh, uh, paths towards technology that are at the, at the heart of the great power competition that's taking place today between uh, the United States and, and China primarily. And I would include that health security and, and yeah, other things like that. And uh, he, you know, we, we, when we began to explore this idea, it became clear that part of the thing that they, they very much need and want is to be able to build in indigenous capabilities. Mm -hmm. And they and, and so I think they, they've have she's described they've had choices. China has come to them and said we are willing to share with you the source code for things, and will but in return they have to share all their stuff with China. That sounds great. Uh, South Korea yeah. said South Korea yeah. has come along yeah. and been a, a decent partner more recently, mm -hmm. but to his great pleasure and somewhat surprise, he's found that Israel has become mm -hmm. an important partner for them in key mm -hmm. areas of knowledge sharing, you know, exactly. evolution. And t so tell exactly. me why you think this is important. And, and I say, it, so for some, it might seem counterintuitive. You're a member of the Likud. Mm -hmm. You're a security oriented, you know, oriented person. You know, traditionally, some say, well, don't do that, you know. Mm -hmm. But here you are saying, yeah, yeah, yeah. And mm -hmm. you run, you know, science technology and, and, and you've been in Egypt. Why is this a good idea? Well, I mean, I think it is. Yeah. Why? First of all, I want, I want to... Um, answer your question about uh, ideology and education. Mm -hmm. uh, First of all, they need to educate the next generation uh, to peace, uh, especially the Palestinians, not to destroy Israel or to live beside Israel or with the Israelis. And not, I think that their ideology is to live uh, um, not beside Israel, uh, instead of in Israel. Spite, in, in spite of Israel. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is a huge problem. It's a problem of education. And, and the, I... Uh, ideology of, let's say, let's talk about two main forces. I heard Ambassador Erdan talk to, to today, he, he talked about two camps, he said, uh, quote, two camps, he said, in the Middle East, in, the, in our region, uh, let's say the good guys like Bahrain, Emirates, Israel, okay, Egypt and Jordan, and the bad guys. 
I suppose he talked about Iran, Syria, Hezbollah, and Hamas. Actually, don't forget, don't forget the Houthis. The, you know the, the Houthis, Houthis, are Houthis of course, and the Al Qaeda, and and, and the Al Nusra, ISIS. That's and right. They all have, they all have different names, that's but they right. want the same thing. I think that's right. But you, I, I think that we must hear them mm-hmm. because if someone says that he wants to kill you, you better believe him. Mm-hmm. What happened in Europe in the thirties? You know, a crazy leader said that he wants to destroy you, to kill you. And all the, you know, most of, most of the countries and the states all over the world say, okay, maybe he's crazy, he will not do anything. And we got the World War II, the Second World War, by the way, also in September. I said that it's a very, you know, very important uh, Didn't realize you were such a history that's buff. Right. That's right, that's right. And according to your question, I, w- I will tell you from my experience. When I served for five years as a Minister of Science and Technology, we signed uh, more than 30 new agreements between Israel and, I will give you some examples, China, India, Argentina, Brazil, Canada, uh, state of California, um, uh, Austria as far as I remember, Portugal, and other countries. And I said, let's cooperate, let's collaborate. Uh, We have great minds, you also have great minds, but Israel is a powerhouse of innovation, technology, and science. It's for the benefit of, your, of the world and for your citizens. Yeah. And uh, we convinced more than 30 countries that they want to do it. And if the Emirates, the Maharajas, I know already that they want it. But let's say, let's talk about the, Leb- the Lebanon, about Lebanon. Uh, the, the, the Syrians, you know, ruin, they, they ruin it. You know, it wasn't a situation that Lebanon was in a, in, in a war with Israel as a, as a Christian uh, country. What happened is that the Syrians ruined Lebanon in the 70s. Yeah. And, you know, Sectarian the snowball, war in that's the Iranians, right. Of course, sure. That's right. So, and they are so very close to Haifa, to the University of Haifa, to, to the Technion, to uh, you name it. So we can cooperate, we can collaborate if they want to. And I think that if, let's say, our neighbors accept the, let's say, the Emirates, the Gulf states, will convince that that's what we want, really. And this is our goal as a, as a country, as a state. The state of Israel, maybe, 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 one day in the future, they will change their, their mind. But when it will happen, when they, as I said, educate the, the, the kids in, mm-hmm. the, in the kindergartens. The, 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 I'm not, I'm talking about Lebanese. Syria, Egypt, Lebanon, and Egypt, the Palestinians, and, I think the and other countries that don't want well, peace with Israel and don't want Israel at all. You know, when I think about, I know that you were involved in Israel's um, uh, space uh, moon, moonshot, yeah, you know, which course. is an exciting project. I was responsible as a minister of science and technology. And, and the, one of my friends in Dubai uh, runs the think tank where they incubated their space program mm-hmm. and, and launched the mm-hmm. whole thing. And, um, and, you know, first it was a satellite program on these things. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, in terms of, uh, America has great strengths in, in space. You know, we're a big, big, strong country, so we excel in what we call lift. Mm-hmm. But as I understand it, Israel is the world's leader in, uh, or one of the world's leaders in second stage propulsion, which mm-hmm. is the very delicate work of making things move in a vacuum of space, which requires very delicate p- so, uh, and that, that, that technology is extremely important these days, particularly because people need to be moving around in space with satellites now in different ways than, than they have in the past. Mm-hmm. Anyway, it just reminds me that with, uh, as much as I adore America's Five Eyes partners, it doesn't strike me that it'll be England or Canada or Australia or New Zealand that's going to be leading uh, the Western allies, America, to, uh, to, the, to the finish line ahead of China in quantum computing or mm-hmm. hypersonic or nano microtech or some of these others, where, you know, where Israel and some of the other innovative uh, countries and opportunities exist to accelerate some of that work you know, or, or under the rubric of the accords, mm-hmm. perhaps. Um, you know, and I, 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 I was just struck by how happy uh, the, the folks in, in Dubai were to be working with Israel Absolutely. and feeling respected 
Mm. I think the thing was the thing the thing that oh, I heard from them that was most important, and they talk about they they, they value America's relationship, mm -hmm. but when they're told no, you can't have you can't look in this box. Mm -hmm. We don't they, we just don't trust you with this. But when they, when when Israel became a country that said you know we want to work closely with you, that I think gave them the same feeling of warmth mm -hmm. that that the Israelis mm -hmm. get when we see the kind of embrace that is out there. It's unbelievable. I saw the leadership of the United uh, Arab Emirates, and I, I must say, I, it, it's, it's astounding. They want to be number one, and they are doing it right. It's just unreal. They are moving towards their objective, understanding that partnering with Israel is an added value, particularly on those issues which you've mentioned, and exactly in the same manner they decided okay we strategically are going for peace we will be number one the role model of how you do peace well and, and, and they are teaching the world yeah. and the region on how to go about peacemaking which is incredible i've been impressed with their lawmaking you know their their regulatory affairs you know we talked about no double taxation in, in, earlier today mm -hmm. uh, but they they've made it possible for people who are not emirati citizens to own companies there you know that makes it possible for joint ventures to happen it makes it possible for foreign investment you know all kinds of at levels that were not possible before and i, I do you see that as an avenue for for others to follow for is israel going what can what more can israel do to ease this this economic union a lot. <laughs> a lot. First of all, first of all Ruth is right. Uh, I think that the, the main idea is that they want to learn from us. And you mentioned the space uh, industry. It's not, it's not, it's, it's very important. And we signed already an agreement with the Emirates. But it's not only a space uh, industry. Let's take the um, water tech not only in our region, mm -hmm. yeah. all over the world there's a problem of water, even in California and Spain and Portugal and in our region, of course. And increasing with global uh, climate change, I imagine. That's right, because of the climate change, of course. And um, they want uh, to learn from us how to do it. Uh, so this is, this is water tech. Agri-tech, it's the same thing. It's the same thing. It's agriculture, but with a lot of high tech. And they know that they can learn from Israel. Uh, if you can, you know, uh, how the famous song says, let's make lots of money. If you can make lots of money with it, you know, uh, why not? And this is the difference. Maybe one of the main differences. It's not we talked about ideology and we talked about uh, education. Um, they are part of the free world. They are part of the Western world. And the others, and we mentioned Syria, we mentioned mm -hmm. Iran, Afghanistan now, yeah. the Taliban again, they're with us again after 20 years. <laughs> yeah, they're, well, they're here again. It's not yeah. funny. It's, it's very, I'm worried yeah. because from Afghanistan, from Kabul, through Tehran, through, and Iraq is not very stable, and of course Syria and Lebanon, it's from the Mediterranean almost to China, and uh, they want to destroy all this, you know, all the, all, the, all the idea of the new world, of the democracies. And, and uh, as I said, we are two different forces. Well, you know, it strikes me a couple of things. First, you know, the, the, the race for some of these technologies is not a race mm -hmm. for technology, it's a race for freedom of thought. You're right. You know, quantum computing is not about quantum computing. It's about, You're right. It's about the right to say You're the right. things that we want to say without, you know, because if, if one government has it, they can read everybody's everything or, or not, you know? Absolutely. And, and so I think it's, these, are, these are very practical things for people's lives. And, and in addition to that, uh, you know, you've got, you've got countries, uh, you know, who have mutual interests. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you've got other countries who, uh, like, like Russia, like China, whose, whose activities on an ongoing basis are largely to disrupt the flow of stability of, of, of Western trade. You know, the dollar is worth what the American military is willing to say it's worth because it shows up and protects the free flow of trade. And so I think, you know, as we, as we look forward to, you know, to, to the next, you know, 40, 50 years, mm -hmm. despite the fact that we've seen some, of, some American withdrawal in some of these areas, and I want to come back to that in a sec, 
I do. I still believe that America remains the global leader and the global partner mm -hmm. uh, that that is critical for Israel and all of our allies right. to, to 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 join with. But uh, I wonder whether the the recent events in Afghanistan and uh, the upcoming departure of American military forces from Iraq, mm -hmm. which of course Iran dominates already, and I imagine if America leaves, that that will become even stronger. Uh, the withdrawal this week of the sophisticated Patriot missile batteries that were protecting Abakake and the Saudi Arabian oil fields. I'm not sure why America decided to remove those uh, when tensions with Iran are so high, but all these things are happening at once. Does that for you mean that the, kind of does, it, does it make you think that these accords and the framework and the potential of the framework is, is more important or more vulnerable? Mm -hmm. More important. More important. Certainly. I think that uh, America is, was, and remains a huge ally of Israel. Um, we have aligned interests. We have aligned ideologies. We have a love of life rather than death. And our value system is similar. We have our differences, but that's legitimate. Um, having said that, there is a concern regarding um, the Syrian arena. Um, I would say the entrenchment of Iranian um, influence in Syria, not to mention Hezbollah in uh, Lebanon. Um, Afghanistan is very worrying. Um, I quite understand that after so much resources, energy, and American lives, the United States feels that it has done its duty and does not want to still stay there. And I cannot say, unfortunately, that that is not worrying because the alternative is so the other world. Yeah that potentially can breed terrorism, have it exported and dominate our good societies. And I believe that the fact that we have the Abraham Accords is an opportunity to put our minds together and to try and think creatively about the solutions to these specific problems. It's all of our problems. It's not America's problem. It's not Israel's problem. It's the UAE's problem just as much. Yeah. Iran is an issue. Iran, Afghanistan yeah. is an issue. Global terrorism is an issue. Global warming is an issue. Well, the black flag now is back flying. And it seemed, what struck me about the, I think if you asked Americans, should, should America wind up its role in Afghanistan? You would have gotten a, a pretty wide-ranging yes. If, on the other hand, you'd ask that question, provide the information that the consequence of that choice would have been to, to restore the caliphate and to, and to put back into power the very people who are responsible for the subjugation of women in societies that we, we so greatly oppose, I think you would have gotten the opposite answer. And for allowing a sanctuary for bin Laden, who is very well known in every home in the United States for being antagonistic to the very existence of this wonderful country. This is another date in uh, September. Uh, yeah, right. Correct. Actually, yeah. actually. Well, you and know, this is the uh, whole story, I have to tell you. Please. This, is, this is the whole story. You asked about the, the uh, Abraham Accords and the, the change in the atmosphere uh, and at the attitude. This is the whole story. This is the whole story. The extremists, against the uh, people that want, you know, to be free. And from time to time, you know, to earn money. And it's not, a, you know, it's not a rude uh, word. And I think that uh, it's, it's a huge problem from one hand. Of course, Afghanistan, Iran, Hezbollah, Hamas, Islamic Jihad in, in Egypt as well. Mm -hmm. it's, as well, it's, it's also, also a part of the problem. And the fact that, uh, let's say, uh, countries, states, in the Persian Gulf, uh, two of them, Bahrain and the Emirates, decided, and it was very, a very brave step from their leaders, 
to uh, step out and to say and to declare, we don't want to be with you anymore. I don't want to be with Iran. The Iranian threat is, is, is threat on us. You know, we used to talk about the small Satan, it's Israel, the middle Satan, Europe, and the, the big Satan, it's United States. But I think that uh, if you will ask the Iranians uh, in Afghanistan, the Taliban in Afghanistan, they will say the Persian Gulf states, the Emirates in Bahrain, they are they're part of the, let's say, the small Satan, okay? So we don't want it anymore. Who wants it? Yeah. You know, all the, <laughs> the idea of uh, jihadists and all you that. You know, as I, I've thought of this, and I, hearing, you know, so, uh, in the ambassador talk about two camps today, I've thought about it a little bit more in three. Yeah. Uh, you know, you've got, you know, you've got uh, Iran, and it runs its pillar of extremists, mm -hmm. if you will. You know, mm -hmm. and it's got Hezbollah, and it's got the Houthis, and it's got its, you know, mm -hmm. armies, and it's got its proxies, and the guys they bring mm -hmm. around their... Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and they're... And they're goal is to dominate the region and everybody under them at their pace. Mm -hmm. And then you've got, uh, you know, the, the, the Sunni version of that, and its state sponsors have often been Qatar and, and Turkey mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and others in the past, but less so. Mm -hmm. Without a doubt. With, with less so, though, the others in the last, since 9-11, let's say. And now many of those countries are the ones that are engaged in the Abraham Accords with Israel. Um, and and so that that Sunni pillar run by Qatar and, and and Turkey is really you know the worst elements in mm -hmm. were in Syria Al Nusra Al Qaeda mm -hmm. you know, the Boko Harams of the world There's, even the Brotherhood of Sunni so they all have mm -hmm. they go by different names um, but in fact those two camps um, are, are not enemies mm -hmm. despite sometimes the United States government wanted to present Iran as the enemy of ISIS there are these two pillars no they're not enemies but they're they're rivals for mm -hmm. the for the dominance mm -hmm. of the region and the other camp is the one that you know comprises comprises of Israel and Egypt and Jordan and Bahrain and the countries that you're talking about mm -hmm. that want to trade with each other mm -hmm. and work together and 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 live a live a, a, a life that relates to the the modern world mm -hmm. and so you've got medievalism Mm -hmm. Two sides of one of one coin uh, that confuses people because because they because often you, when people when they say oh no that one's an enemy and this was a bad no it's actually it's it, it is actually simpler than that. I, I would think. say that both are enemies of the um, of our world. Yes, and yet they're enemies of one another as well. So very much like the Fatah is the enemy of Hamas. In fact, I believe they hate each other more than they hate us. Then the Hamas hates us. I think that the Shiites and the Iranian domination or seeking domination is in fact in competition with that of the Sunni <clears throat> extremism. However, there are extremists and they are on the other side of the road, so to speak. You know, the, the, the challenge, it seems to me, is that You've got, um, uh, again, here in the United States it was a problem because in Syria, Robert Ford was, was the ambassador and he was trying to be very clear that America needed to act more fully to prevent the entrenchment of Iranian forces mm -hmm. and the entrenchment of Hezbollah. And there was a moment where America could have blown up the six runways or eight runways total mm -hmm. in the country. <laughs> and, and could have bombed every black flag and every Hezbollah unit and every Iranian army unit and just left the country to others. Let you know the now when the, the when the White House decided not to do that and left the French Air Force idling on the runway and <laughs> David Axelrod <clears throat> said, "Well, now Congress is the dog caught in that grill." You know, mm -hmm. was having to having to make a decision about this. It was a real cowardly uh, moment. Um, and it led to other cowardly moments where they uh, des desisted from getting involved in order to curry favor with Iran in the nuclear talks. So these things are related. And I look at the Syria example as a, as a tragedy, a human tragedy, a political failure, all these things. And I look at Afghanistan in the, you know, I just, I'm still gut-wrenched to, to, to see to what, what took place. But I also am concerned, as you pointed out, that it was really not about the presence there. It was the thumb in the dike. And by removing our thumb on the dike there and restoring a caliphate that has now access to passports and Interpol mm -hmm. and a central bank mm -hmm. and all these things and allows the, the Russia to tell America, unfreeze their money, you know, it, it, it restores a, a caliphate. And, uh, you know, this is a concern because next you've got Iran 
And it, Iran wants to gobble up more Arab states. And it's got control over Iraq in some ways. And if America f- falls through its, with its withdrawal, mm-hmm. what, what then happens? How do you look at the, that, that next? Are you talking to people here about that and expressing Absolutely. concern? And uh, is, there, is there receptivity to the words? Do they hear you? First of all, we're, we're doing it all the time. I'm doing it all the time. Mm-hmm. And I'm doing it, uh, let's say, especially uh, when I uh, uh, started uh, you know, to be a member of the parliament, even though I did it be also before, but as a minister, I, I did it as, uh, as well. And I have to tell you that uh, it's very difficult to, to change people's mind and people's uh, you know, uh, uh, ideology, even it's you know, part of the uh, democratic world. And it, it's, people who came with you, you know, they're... they're thinking a lot of, uh, let's say, thoughts <coughs> about uh, their point of view of the world. And, and I, I see it differently. I think that you must say, and I said all the time during the Obama's administration and uh, John Kerry's and his ideas, uh, he offered uh, to uh, Netanyahu as prime minister, I uh, read it, <coughs> that um, he said, that uh, Afghanistan, the model of, of Afghanistan is, uh, you know, uh, must be in uh, uh, Judea and Samaria. John Kerry uh, has made yeah. some of the most incredible <laughs> remarks. He yeah. will go down in history as a, as a man who's been wrong out loud more than most. Okay, th- th- that was a mistake. Well, how uh, about there'll be no peace? Never, 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 uh, never, never, never. Right. That was no. my favorite quote. What happens is if we want peace. <laughs> we don't want to destroy ourselves. Right. And uh, I, I believe that uh, only the IDF, uh, okay, we can cooperate <clears throat> with other countries, but at the end, the, the IDF Tzva Ganal Israel is the only force that can force Israel from the Jordan Valley, from the Golan Heights, uh, around the Gaza Strip. That was, by the way, the disengagement was a mistake. This is one of the reasons, the Oslo agreements and then the disengagement with the Palestinians that uh, uh, the Israelis, most of them, not all of them, of course, uh, not, yeah, they, they don't believe to the Palestinians you know, anymore. This idea has become largely conventional wisdom, <clears throat> I think, across the political spectrum in Israel. It's a surprise to me, as an outsider, that you know, these efforts that were seen as so positive for peace, in the end, while they were champions of the peace <clears throat> camp, if you will, and I'm, I'm, not, you know, I'm not trying to make you the spokesman for that person, but. but they ended up being a boomerang, you know, in some ways. How, how do you describe that? What, what's the dynamic there? I think that we need to learn from um, history and from, um, from mistakes made in the past. And I think if we look at the um, moving away of America from Afghanistan and try and uh, compare, it is very different, but there are similarities to the moving away of the IDF from Gaza, as an example. I think that the question lies within the not moving away from a place that is essentially, axiomatically not yours, but rather creating the conducive basis or platform for it to govern itself, which is, in fact, a utopic dream That's not to say that it's not possible, but it is a very difficult objective to reach. So if we look, for instance, at Gaza, it is an extremely difficult solution to reach. There are two million people there held captive by nothing less than a murderous terrorist organization which literally is using and manipulating those poor people um, with youngsters, high percentage of drug abuse, um, little hope. And one needs to look at this tragedy. It, It exists. We as Israelis know what it is to feel tragedy. And my heart and the hearts of many Israelis go out to that. The question is, what is the alternative? What is the alternative when their leadership is throwing missiles at civilian population within Israel? 
where the southern part of Israel, bordering Gaza, is in post-traumatic stress. I'm talking about huge numbers of people because they live within a reality of bombings. Yeah. I don't think people realize that when a siren goes off, you know, Iron Dome goes off down south, if you're a mom or a dad driving to the grocery store or to school and you've got kids, you have 15 seconds mm -hmm. to stop the car, mm -hmm. unbuckle yourself, mm -hmm. get out of the car, go to the back, open the door, unbuckle your kids, pick them up, mm -hmm. and then run for the closest shelter. Uh, 15 so seconds want, in that one moment, right? I want I just, to say something it's not about appreciated, it. I think. I, I want to say something about maybe to the end of our conversation, mm -hmm. because we talked almost about everything, and uh, it's very interesting, I have to tell you, about Gaza. Uh, I have a dream, I can say it here in Washington. I have a dream, really, I have to tell you, as, as, as a right-wing person, that Aza uh, one day will be like Singapore, or let's say, like the Emirates. And it's possible, it's possible, because they have a beautiful beach, beautiful, beautiful beach. They're very close to the natural gas uh, and the resources. They're very close to Israel and they can cooperate with us. Uh, agriculture, water, you name it. But they need to decide. They need to decide if they want the Hamas regime, as Ruth mentioned, uh, and it's, it's hurts you know, all, all humankind to see little children you know, that uh, are living there. It's child and abuse. I, when I think of Hamas and, and these things, I think, it's, I think it's child abuse. Yeah, 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 and I, wish, yeah, I think yeah. we, should, we should talk yeah, yeah. more about yeah. it as child yeah. abuse. It is systemic child abuse. Actually, you yeah. just need I to interrupt. Look. Uh, my apologies, you just no, no, need no. to look at the um, summer camps. Mm -hmm. Of course. We talked about education before. And this is one of the problems. The education is to destroy Israel. You know, I remember in the 90s, during the Oslo agreements, you know, the days of the, the it was some Israelis that were very optimistic then. I wasn't, by the way. And I saw little kids in their summer camps. They took, uh, you know, a picture of a bus number five, like it's the most popular line in Tel Aviv, or 18, one of the most popular lines in Jerusalem, and they're making a show about, you know, the explosion. What's this? Excuse me, what about your education? By the way, then it wasn't Hamas regime in Gaza. Yeah. Then it wasn't, it was under Yasser Arafat regime, then. So there is no huge differences, unfortunately, in their attitude to Israel, and I agree that it is, it is a huge problem. Uh, well, but uh, we will defend ourselves, and yeah. we will defend our citizens. It is, it is striking, though, I think, and it is a good point to sort of begin to wrap up, that the decision to make peace with Israel is not a decision that Israel needs to make, it's a decision that others need to make. Exactly. I think, I think if I may That's just right. point something out, I think it is our duty as a value-oriented country to do everything within our vested power to reach peace, including confidence building measures and making sure that we understand that there are people held captive on the other side. And yet as Ophira Kuhn is from the opposition, we do not disagree about this. Right. Has mentioned, this is something that needs to be clear in the minds and the hearts of the leadership. So we do need to make confidence building measures. We do need to ease the difficulties. But finally, it is a, a decision made by the leadership on the other side, not whether they want to make peace with Israel, whether they want to live. What is Qatar? I want to say something uh, <laughs> that uh, is very, maybe is, uh, it relates uh, to this question, no doubt. That, yeah. that, that's right. Their leaders must be Sadat mm -hmm. and to come to their parliament, if there is a parliament there, uh, and to say no more war. No more war. And then the war will end. This is it. If they will say, if they, will, they are saying we want the war to continue until we destroy Israel, nothing will happen. But if they will say, like Sadat in 1977, in the parliament in Cairo, no more war, and I want to travel to Jerusalem, and, uh, and, and within a week, he came to the Knesset? Yeah. 
that is very uh, I hope that it will uh, happen this dream will happen one why day. does Qatar play such a, a negative role in the region and why does Israel continue to allow it to do so you want to yeah, talk about Qatar I have a very clear opinion about Qatar I think it plays a very negative role politically correct or not I think that um, it should be allowed a role which is very, very curbed um, and supervised. I'm not sure exactly what are the incentives of the regime in Qatar, <clears throat> but there is not one-sided um, incentivization leading that country. Um, I can tell you from my point of view the former government had Qatar play a larger role than it should. I sincerely hope that the current government in Israel will not give in once more to that kind of role playing. I think that trying to give the money that needs to go into Gaza via the Palestinian Authority is a better path. It's not an optimal path, but it is supervised by the UN. Why is it a better path? Not because the Palestinian leadership in the West Bank is not corrupt. <laughs> not because there is a huge love of Israel and Zionism oozing out of that leadership, no. But Hamas cannot be allowed to be the dictator of what it is that will happen. And this is an indication to Hamas, you will not decide, we will decide. Of course, the Fatah is a huge enemy of Hamas. As I said before, they hate the Fatah more than they hate us, if that's a possibility. And therefore, creating an alternative for the huge role given to Qatar in giving cash to Hamas is something that is not optimal, but an initiative rather than a um, kind of um, an answer to something that Hamas initiates. And I believe it's better than before. Is it optimal? No. And that's why, let me go back to the Abraham Accords. Let us put our minds together. Qatar is a huge enemy in terms of perception to Egypt, huge enemy in terms of perception to the UAE. It plays a very um, dancey role in terms of Israel and the US as well doing whatever it wants whenever it's convenient. And therefore, we can put our minds together within the framework of the Abraham Accords, whether you are on the right or the left, Republican or Democratic, whether you are um, black, white, Muslim, Jewish, and think out of the box how the region can be more stable. Qatar is not the answer to stability in the region. I love that answer. Yeah. I, I, we, we don't have much time left. I, I, we can yeah. talk about Qatar more. You have somebody saying, I have one more question I wanted to get in. Okay. You have more on Qatar you want to say? No, I want I to say that. I thought that was a great that, answer. Uh, I want to say, to close this, this, this really yeah. uh, very interesting this, uh, discussion, that uh, I'm, I'm, at the end, I'm very optimistic because uh, the Abraham Accords are a beautiful example to a change because they started to think out of the box. Mm -hmm. And this is the formula, to think out of the box. Well, speaking of the box, yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm thinking of Iran, and I know we just have a couple yeah. minutes left, and this week, um, uh, uh, well, this will be last week, but right around now there, there's a meeting going on in Vienna mm -hmm. um, where uh, there's a discussion about not putting forward a, res a conditional resolution uh, demanding Iran provide access to 
the artificial uranium that's been discovered in places. Now, I think it's important for people to remember, and not everyone realizes this, that there are now nine new nuclear weapons sites, including three where uh, uranium has been found, that the world did not know about exactly. before the archive was taken out of, of Iran, and that there are an additional tw- additional you know, 12 to 14 sites that also need inspection where they were making uranium metal and other parts that have never been inspected. I made mean, a, a policy paper that's on the Hudson website that lists all of these sites, including what was happening mm-hmm. there and their priorities and these things. Mm-hmm. And, you know, as Iran turns off the cameras in, in Natanz and the declared facilities, they create a big uproar. And it mm-hmm. is true, it's a problem. They can, move, they can be moving mm-hmm. things and diverting things. But the world seems to be forgetting that there's a parallel track Mm-hmm. for which we now have enormous evidence, and of course, North Korean travel documents. Uh, and where is the rest of this stuff? Now, at the IAEA you know, meetings, uh, the Iranians appear to uh, have bought more time uh, for a century. They've, they've, and they've somewhat agreed to some uh, replacement of the monitoring devices. Now, whether anyone gets switched before the end of this meeting or not, I would, I would not place my, my, my mortgage on it. But... Um, mm-hmm. That will then allow them another two months of, of monkeying around. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it, it, I think it was Benny Gantz 10 weeks ago that said, or five weeks ago that said in 10 weeks Iran would be there. That's five weeks ago. They're five weeks now. And I work closely with Oli Heinonen and David Albright. And uh, we, we had a press conference on Friday that r- shared with people that Iran is not months away from being able to break out. They've been practicing breakout. And they have enough nuclear, 60% material right now for a bomb and almost two that they could up enrich uh, with one cascade in three, three to four weeks. And they could do that, of course, in the tons while the cameras are running, but no one's seeing them. Mm-hmm. How much ambiguity can Israel tolerate? Let me put it very gently. There is a clear threshold um, that going one millimeter after that is certainly not something that Israel can tolerate. Um, This is not a threat. It's a defense mechanism. We've made that clear to everybody. I think the US well understands that. Frankly, I feel that the current administration (coughs) also understands that. I think that the means towards the same end are different from administration to administration. And I do believe that in order to have all possibilities on the table, one needs to have a significant coalition. That's not to say that Israel cannot act alone. But two things. One, it's not only an anti-Israel threat, and therefore Israel should not be alone. And two, It is truly better to have the opportunity to have like-minded partners stand on the same stance operatively vis-a-vis this mutual threat. It is not to be tolerated, just to be very clear in answer to your question. It is not to be tolerated, and once more, it is not to be tolerated. It's not only an Israeli uh, issue, even though uh, Israel is uh, actually, it's all, um, I can say that Israel is a one state bomb. One state bomb. One, one, one bomb can destroy most of the state of Israel. Uh, but it's not only an Israeli uh, problem. Uh, um, I think that uh, I will say it very uh, short and clear to the world and to the United States as well. Do not repeat bad agreement. Don't do it. Not in Vienna, not in uh, Paris, not anywhere in the world. Iran, it's a huge, huge problem. Uh, I think that I can say that even to uh, Russia, uh, of course, we talked about Europe, United States, Israel, of course, the Gulf, the Persian Gulf uh, uh, countries, and, and other parts of the world. So don't close your eyes and say nothing will happen because 
very, very bad things can happen if we will close our eyes in front of this, you know, the, the, the dangerous situation that we already, as you said, yeah. uh, we are already, almost al already there. I, you know, I, I, I worry about it because, uh, you know, if Iran doesn't, doesn't evacuate the 60% material from the country yeah. in the next couple of weeks, mm -hmm. I just don't see any way to be confident that they're not monkeying around with it. You know, and I don't know how Israel looks at these questions, but it is a, it puts the country in a very, mm -hmm. very difficult position uh, when, when, when its fate is in the hands of Iranian cooperation to show mm -hmm. where its goods are. We don't feel that our fate is in the hands of the Iranian cooperation. We don't feel that there is Iranian cooperation. And I'm convinced that the American administration, the current one as well, as I said before, knows that there's no real Iranian cooperation at this particular moment. And the question is, um, again, exactly as you had asked, what is the threshold? Until when will Israel be able to... Tolerate accept, this ambiguity, tolerate. right? Yeah. You know, I, the it, Abraham Accords provide a good opportunity, though, right? Because you've got coalitions of folks who've, who, right. who, you know, who just have similar ideas. You won't, you're not alone in your concern about these things. Yeah, I'm not saying in action, but you know, that, I hope that does does create a a, a better sense of of uh, you know collective mm -hmm. unity there. On the other hand, you know, the world didn't want Pakistan to go nuclear. The world didn't want India to go nuclear. Mm -hmm. The world didn't mm -hmm. want all these countries go nuclear, and they managed to. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I, I read the interview that the former Ambassador Ron Dermer gave uh, mm -hmm. recently, and I thought his, his comment was, was right on. He said that we didn't want those countries to go nuclear, and at the moment, if you follow the trajectory that Iran is on, they too will get there unless someone, namely perhaps Israel in his, in his interview, intervenes. Now, I don't know that it needs to be Israel, but um, it's certainly after the display of American power and, and uh, effort in Afghanistan, it must... It must prompt leaders in all kinds of countries to um, be thinking about having to take matters into their own hands more directly sooner than they thought. I mean, I, you know. <clears throat> I think that this option is definitely on the table. And it's been said. It's been said publicly. By the way, interestingly, it's been said by the U.S. as well. We'll see. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for spending thank some time you. together. It's really wonderful to see such, such great leadership mm -hmm. representing the state of Israel on both sides thank of its political aisle. Thank you very much for hosting us and for your uh, tremendously insightful vision and uh, the deep questions that um, are so very important, not only for Israel and the region, but also, of course, for the United States. Indeed. Thank you for your time. It was a very unique, I have to say, discussion. Uh, you can see it on the television lately, unfortunately, and I'm saying it for mm -hmm. for years. So we need we need institutes like Hudson Institute to reflect the uh, fact that people can talk and uh, people can say uh, very very interesting and important things in a you know, situation like we are. And uh, the most important thing is that the world will listen and uh, will act like we are acting here. Well, I know that the Hudson Institute is committed to doing more programming, Good. covering issues of importance to America and certainly uh, to the Middle East. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, and we are pleased to be able to, to have you yeah. as a, an early participant in that effort. So thank you so much thank for you. being with us. Thank you thank very you. much.